Good morning. So we start uh, the lesson for the next chapter, complex numbers. So this is a, a little bit technical uh, topic. Uh, so let us start to motivate uh, this topic first and then continue uh, to learn different pieces of this uh, very important part of mathematics. <coughs> Uh, okay, so if I want to motivate you why we actually need the set of complex numbers, let us look at a little bit of the history of uh, equations, yes? So the first set that probably human was aware of was the set of natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, etc., yes? Uh, for obvious reasons, yes? And then, <clears throat> for example, assume that you have an equation x minus 1, let, must, let us keep these, very thing, these things very simple, equals to 0. Okay, if I solve this equation, then of course you get x equals to 1. And the set of natural numbers, which is denoted by this n, is the set of 1, 2, 3, 4, and etc. So we would say that this set is enough uh, for solving this equation. What do we mean by that? It means that when you solve the equation and you find the root of that equation, the number that you get as the answer is one of the elements in your set. So another equation that you can consider, for example, 2x minus 10 equals to 0. Then if you solve this polynomial equation, you get x equals to 5. So still you don't need to extend your set. The set of natural numbers is still enough if your goal is to solve this equation. Why? Because when I get the answer, the answer is in my set if the next number is 5. But of course, clearly, this is not enough for all possible polynomial uh, equations. For example, let me just consider another very simple equation. Uh, yes, x plus 1 equals to 0. If I solve this equation, if I want to solve this equation and I want to limit myself only to this set, of course it is clear that I will not find any solution for this because the answer, the solution to this equation is x equals to minus 1 and it does not belong to the set of natural numbers. This one belongs to the set of natural numbers. This one also belongs to the set of natural numbers. So the set of natural numbers was enough to solve this equation and that equation, but it is not enough to solve this equation. So this motivates me to mathematicians to extend the set of natural numbers to a bigger set containing the solutions of this equation as well. And then, of course, historically you know that uh, this, the next set they consider is the set of all uh, integers, appending negative integers to the set of natural numbers, and then we come up with a set like minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and etc. Of course, this is not in n, but of course you see that this belongs to z. Okay, so the set of uh, integers is enough to solve this equation. But again, the story continues, yes? If I ask you to solve this very simple equation, then what you get as the answer is x equals to 1 half. Then you immediately realize this is not in the set z, so this means that set z is also not enough if I my goal is to solve this equation because the answer that I get is not an element of the set z and this motivated people to extend this set to a bigger set containing these kinds of solutions and then hopefully you know that the next one in this hierarchy is the set of rational numbers, yes? But the set of rational numbers cannot be written so nicely with dots, yes? We need to define them. So what is the definition of a rational number? We would say a rational number is a fraction, like A over B, but not any sort of fractions, a fraction whose numerator and the denominator belongs to the set of nat integers, and of course B shouldn't be equal to zero. 
okay so now you hopefully agree with me that 1 over 2 is in the set of rational numbers yes uh, because the numerator is an integer and the denominator is also an integer and of course the denominator is not equal to 0 so this 1 over 2 which was not in the set of integers now it belongs to the set of rational numbers uh, but of course we can still continue for example let us consider this equation x squared minus 2 equals to 0 if I want to solve this equation then of course you know x squared should be equals equal to 2 and then if I take the square root it becomes plus or minus the square root of 2 neither of these solutions are in Q of course it is not that straightforward to see that this cannot be written as a fraction whose numerator and the denominator are coming from the set of uh, integers but this is not so hard um, and the people who had math specialization probably remember we showed that the square root of 2 is not a rational number it means that it cannot be written as in the form of a fraction you cannot find any fraction whose numerator and denominators are integers and when you divide them it becomes exactly square root of 2 uh, but of course how we can uh, I think if I remember correctly Pythagoras actually realized that this number should exist but I think I don't know how religion is related to this but because of religious beliefs they only beliefs they only considered that the uh, the world should consist of only rational numbers and of course they realize that such a number exists and it is not rational but try they try to hide it or something like that but why Pythagoras realized such a number should exist is because of his theorem yes for example if you consider a right angle triangle you can take your ruler and draw that and then people knew how to draw perpendicular lines so um, one two three four five so let me go up here yes and then assume that this is a right angle triangle whose sides are equal to one so immediately Pythagoras himself realized that uh, by the way this is possible to do it in the in our uh, in the world yes I can just make a line with one meter and then draw another perpendicular line to this again with the same one the length of one meter and then according to his own theorem if he wants to measure this using his theorem he realized that if he called this one x then x to the 2 should be equal to 1 to the 2 plus 1 to the 2 it becomes 2 and then it's x squared x should be a number whose second power is 2 so this means and then he realized that this number is not rational so he was trying to avoid this but we cannot avoid that because we know ex this length exists so this number should some somehow exists on the other hand we realize this uh, number is not a rational number so it means that if I want to solve this equation which I really need to solve because of this very simple geometrical problem okay so it means that set Q is still not enough for my purposes there are some equations whose solutions are not inside Q so then we extend Q to the next level and we append all these type of numbers to Q these numbers are called irrational numbers and then we appended all these kind of numbers to Q and we called the set the new set the set of real numbers okay so uh, we extend that one I would say that this would be the set of real numbers if someone asks you what is this this is actually the union of the rational set the set of rational numbers with the set of irrational numbers irrational numbers are the numbers of this form okay and then apparently <clears throat> we were very happy with having uh, 
this set this is the set of all rational numbers uh, together with all irrational numbers the numbers of this type that cannot be written as fractions and the existence of them becomes clear very with this with this very simple setup okay but again you don't need to look very hard you immediately realize still this set is not enough for some of the equations yes for example a very simple equation by the way you don't need to be very smart to see that equation let me make this equation very simple x squared plus 1 equals to 0 <clears throat> definitely and the argument is simple the argument that is square root of 2 does not belong to Q is very technical but the argument that you cannot find any number in the set of R you cannot find any number in the set of R that satisfies this equation is not very technical it is very evident why because if I want to solve this equation one thing that I can do I can move 1 to the right hand side and write minus 1 then I am looking for a number in the set of real numbers so that when I square it it becomes negative 1 okay by the way, I forgot to ask you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. x squared equals to minus 1. Uh, it is easy to see that no such a number exists. exists. Why? Because any number in R, we learn that, even if that number is negative itself, but when I square it, I multiply it by itself, it becomes non-negative. So it is not possible for x squared to be a negative number. So you see that I still have to continue this hierarchy. So what if I want to give you an idea what we did, we actually started with a smaller set like n, and then we realized this is not enough, so we had to extend it. Extend it to some set, call it z. It doesn't mean that we throw everything away from n, no, we just added something new to it. For example, if I want to ask you what are the numbers in n, so one of them is for example 1, the other one is for example 10 or whatever. But we also add something negative here, so for example minus 3. So if I ask you is 1 an integer, you would say yes, because it's a, it's a natural number and it is automatically an integer as well. Okay, but there are some integers that are not natural numbers. For example, minus 3 is still an integer but not a natural number. And then we realize that we have to continue this hierarchy. So we extend it a little bit. These are vague words. I don't know what do I mean by little bit. But there are infinitely many numbers that we added here. And then we called it the set of rational numbers Q. Yes. So for example, so what does this mean? It means that any natural number is automatically a complex number. Uh, sorry, a rational number. Any integer is automatically a rational number. But there are some rational numbers that they not they are not inside z. For example, the simple one that we came up with was just 1 over 2 here. And then we realized that this is not enough, so we had to extend this a little bit. Again, with the vague idea, what do I mean by little? So, And then we had the set of real numbers. For example, square root of 2 is exactly in this, in this ring somewhere here not in Q but then we realize that this is not enough we have to extend it because this simple equation doesn't have any solution in this uh, bigger uh, ellipse here bigger uh, R yes so we have to extend that so unfortunately there is no enough space here let me get rid of this and that one and here I can write here that x is equal to square root of 2 here. I didn't put plus minus here because in the Pythagoras uh, context x is the length of the hypotenuse and it cannot be negative. Okay. So now we want to extend this to another set, yes, set of complex numbers and then 
this is denoted by C. And actually, this has been done by this brilliant uh, genius German mathematician whose name was actually Karl Friedrich Gauss. He is called the Prince of Mathematics. He was actually a genius person and he was living uh, from 17th, no, 18th to 19th century. So this guy actually just from a mathematical curiosity he was thinking that okay this is clear I cannot spend time to find something in R so that it satisfies this equation because of obvious reason any number to second power cannot be negative. He told himself let us imagine let us imagine that there is a number in, in some other uh, number system whose second power is negative 1. And let me call that one uh, i. So, I so this guy gave a symbol to that number i. The symbol he introduced was i because of imaginary, because he was imagining, let us imagine that there is a number somewhere else, of course, it cannot be inside R, but there is a number whose second power is negative 1. Okay, and let us see what, let us explore the consequences of this assumption. But he didn't want, of course, to throw everything away, everything we have developed up to that point, the arithmetic of real numbers is actually a very firm building, so we had uh, spent a lot of time to have that arithmetic. We, the, he said to himself, let us keep all the rules the same, but let us just add one new rule to this game of arithmetic, the arithmetic of real numbers. And that new rule is that, let us imagine that there is a number somewhere, definitely outside the real number system, whose second power is equal to minus 1, and let me give it a name, let us call it i for imaginary, I am imagining. By the way, I am just telling these things to break your resistance about acceptance of this, because when you start thinking of imaginary numbers because of the word imaginary or complex, you think that this is very... Uh, it's very hard to understand, but this is not. Really, if we go back here, you don't feel it here. You always write a square or root of 2 because you get used to, you have got used to it. But if I really ask you what square root of 2 is, what do you answer? One answer is that the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle is what I call square root of 2. This is a very good answer, by the way. One partial answer is that I put this number in the calculator, I get some decimal numbers in the display, and I call that square root of 2. But you know that that's a lie, yes? Because that's an approximation. It's not exactly what we call a square root of 2. Okay? But do you have any idea, if you don't want to define a square root of 2, so what I said is if you put this number in the calculator, that number that you see is not the square root of 2, is something close to square root of 2, but not square root of 2. Well, can you define it for me, by the way, what do you mean by square root of 2? If you want to define it precisely from algebraic point of view, what is the meaning of a square root of 2? Yeah, exactly. So you see, uh, the situation about a square root of 2 is not that better. A square root of, a, a square root of 2 refers to a symbol, it, it refers to a number which we artifact this symbol, you see we put this symbol, this is coming from root, this is actually English R, so we have written it in this form, 
and then we put 2 on it so we invented a symbol for it and we say that the square root of 2 means a number whose second power is 2 that's it and now I am doing the same thing with I I'm just drawing this analogy to see that we are following the same logic I am saying that what is I I is a number of course that number is not inside R that situation was exactly before assume that you are living the period of Pythagoras they didn't know about these kinds of numbers for that time square root of 2 was an imaginary number they had to imagine that there exists a number whose second power is 2 because they were thinking that all numbers are rational numbers and then suddenly they discovered because of Pythagoras theorem that the length of this hypotenuse should be a number whose second power is 2 and then also realize that they cannot find any number in this set that they thought at that time it's a complete set they couldn't find any number in this set whose second power is 2 now assume that you are at that time what do you want to do on the one hand you see this is real it's existing in our universe this is the length of this uh, right angle triangle the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle on the other hand you don't see it here so you are in the same situation then you have to artifact a number whose second power is 2 because you know it exists so you need to give it a name and then you need to invent a symbol for that in modern mathematics I don't know what is the history of this symbol but they have a symbol for that and then we call that the square root of 2 more or less the situation is the same yes uh, but of course it's a little bit different because here at least we can do something physically in our universe we can take a uh, stick meter with one meters and do it like this and construct this and see, point to this uh, hypotenuse and tell me that okay look this length is that number we cannot do the same thing with the imaginary numbers this is the main distinction distinction between real numbers and imaginary numbers if you go to the lab and measure the mass of an electron definitely you will get a real number you cannot uh, go and show okay the length of this is i no we cannot have it might be this is a good name still call it imaginary yes because we cannot say that the length of this thing is i i don't know the mass of an electron is i or a fraction of i or the electric charge of a positron is i to power 3 or whatever so you cannot point something in our universe that that quantity has that value a complex value so this is a still the main distinction between real numbers and uh, complex numbers but from mathematical point of view more or less we are on the same footing yes we are inventing a symbol exactly as we invented the symbol whose second power is 2 now we are inventing another symbol whose second power is minus 1 we know that this does not exist in our set that so far we thought it is complete no there are some numbers uh, that are not in that set so let us extend that that is the idea so this is some kind of motivation behind that okay so what we are doing is this that I want you to have this logic in mind that what we are doing up to this point of the set of real numbers we have learned a lot of math arithmetic rules we knew we know how to add numbers real numbers we know that for example we know that if a and b and c are real numbers for example one famous property is that if i want to multiply a by the sum of b and c what you can do you can multiply a by b you can multiply a by c and add them 
So this is a one rule of the game before even we enter the world of complex numbers. What we want to do, we want to keep all these rules the same, intact. I don't want to touch all those, none, none of those rules. But I want to add one new rule for the game, and that is the reason number whose square is minus 1, and I call that number, I, I denote that number by a symbol i. Yes? So that is the logic. So, for example, if a times b as real numbers is equal to 0, what you can conclude? You can conclude that either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0. We want the same thing happens in the set of complex numbers as well. This is called the zero product rule. So it means that if z and w, these are usually the symbols that we denote complex numbers with, z, w is equal to 0, we still want to conclude that either z is equal to 0 or w is equal to 0. So what I am just, let me summarize that. We have a, a lot of arithmetic rules and a lot of interesting and uh, nice mathematics so far. We want to keep all the rules the same. We want to add one new rule to that. There is a number whose second power is minus 1. Or you can say, let us imagine there is a number whose second power is minus 1. And let us give it a name, imaginary unit, and let us uh, symbolize it uh, with i. Okay? And then let us explore the consequences of this add-on uh, to my uh, real arithmetic. So let us see in this new set uh, what would be the new arithmetic. Of course, I will have all the arithmetic rules that I had before, but there are some nice new things, uh, unexpected sometimes things happen that we want to explore them. Okay, just tell me, is more or less the logic clear? Yes. yes. Okay, so, yeah, this, I, I wanted to see this because... Uh, Sometimes people start resisting, okay, I just want you to follow the logic, go back to the time of Pythagoras, you see that they had the same problem when they encountered actually this square root of 2, then they, we solved that, now we want to do the same thing for that one. But before leaving this section, but this guy actually started introducing this I just because of this thing that I have seen. In his PhD thesis, he actually solved one of the very famous problems that's called Fundamental uh, Theorem of Algebra. It shows that any polynomial equation, uh, by the way, this, he shows that uh, this problem cannot happen again. You don't need, so you might think that, okay, is it possible that sometime uh, in the future we f uh, uh, come across with an equation whose this set is not enough for its solution? The good news is that no, he was able to show that, don't worry, this is the best set forever. If you want to find any the solution of any equations of any polynomial equations you don't need to extend this you will not no surprises is waiting for you okay any polynomial equation that you have the set of complex number is enough for solving that in other words all the possible solutions to a polynomial equation is inside C and you don't need to extend it even more. So that's a very good news. So that would be, this is the end of this hierarchy of number systems. Okay? Uh, okay. But of course, he was living in actually uh, 19th century. Then at that time, people didn't know about that much I don't know if they knew about electrons or thing I don't know I don't remember exactly the timeline uh, but 
in the beginning of 20th century, that's also something good to know. Before, at that time, people, of course, were aware of Newton's law, okay? So what is Newton's law? The Newton's law is actually F equals to MA. And, of course, you know that A is the acceleration of your particle, and M is the mass, and F is the total force acting on that particle. And then you hopefully know that in from physics that A is the first derivative of velocity, and the velocity itself is the first derivative of the position, so it becomes the second derivative of the position. Assume that your particle is moving in just one direction, okay? And that is the X direction. So that is the second derivative. And then, I don't know, I might, you haven't studied this one, if your system is conservative, and then the force can be written as the minus of the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the position of the particle. If you put these back into the Newton's formula, you get, let me write from left to right, m times d squared x over d t squared equals to minus du dx. So this is a little bit more advanced version of Newton's formula. That's a differential equation form of that. But this is just acceleration. You know about that. This is mass, and this is actually the potential energy. If the system is conservative, the force can be found as the derivative of the potential energy. And people started working with this, and more or less every, even these days, most the engineering things that we, constructions, airplanes, and everything are built based on this equation. So it's working very perfectly fine. But in the beginning of 20th century, something strange happened. People wanted to do the same thing. For example, if you have a cannonball, I don't know, in a war, you just shoot it, and for example, your enemy is here, you were able to predict with what velo velocity and which angle you need to project the cannonball so that you can exactly hit the enemy. Okay? So these kinds of calculations are doable just using this formula. Okay? And people started thinking that, okay, we, need, we should be able to use this for all purposes. In the beginning of 20th century, people started learning about electrons. By the way, I remember that the Gauss didn't know about electrons at that time, definitely. And then they thought that electron is a particle, so but a very tiny particle. What is the problem if instead in this equation, instead of instead of m, I put the mass of electron? In principle, I should I should be able to predict the behavior and the trajectory of electrons. But people started using this for these uh, predictions, but when they predicted something on the paper, and when they go to the lab and do the test experiment there, they see that there is a huge discrepancy between what we predict on paper and what we see in reality. Okay, I don't want I don't want to go through it, but later people discovered that okay, if we want to if we want to understand the behavior of an electron, this equation is not good. And then people so Schrodinger, an Austrian Austrian physicist wrote another equation for this. And then interesting thing happens here, yes. So let me write this equation. I don't want you to bother about this. This h bar is just mainly the Planck constant divided by 2 pi, so they denote it by this one. And then you have this, the, this, this symbol is called partial derivative. It's a little bit more advanced version of derivative, but don't worry about these mathematical details. Okay, so, and then this becomes minus h bar squared divided by 2m squared. m is the mass of the electron, and this is the second derivative of something called psi, that's called the wave function. Again, you don't need to bother yourself about these things at all, but, and then you have the potential energy multiplied by psi. So, uh, Schrodinger actually realized that this equation uh, is the equation that we can use to predict the behavior of the electron, but, again, this equation fails unless you put i here, and this I is exactly the I that Gauss introduced in 19th century. Just because of mathematical curiosity, not dealing with physics problem at all. We were just thinking about solving polynomial equations,
And then, in the beginning of 20th century, we realized that Newton's formula is not enough to predict the behavior of an electron. But this equation, yes, this is the first derivative of, with respect to time, this is the second derivative with respect to position, and this U is the potential in energy involved in that problem. This can predict the behavior of an electron if we put this I invented by, I don't know, invented or introduced by Gauss for solving a math problem. So now if you use this equation, of course this is a little bit, much, very technical, how to predict using this equation the behavior of an electron. And if you put that I, then everything is fine. So then on the other hand, I, I don't know if I is an imaginary number because if you just put this I, then you can predict a more or less precisely the behavior of an electron if we agree that electron is something real in the universe, so you see that the existence of this I for prediction, the correct prediction of the behavior of electron is essential. If you take it out from this equation, the equa this equation fails to predict the behavior of an electron. So in this sense, might be I still is a real thing in our universe. I don't know. But as I told you, in, if you look at it in this way, I seems to be real because existence of I is essential to be able to describe the behavior of, ele of an electron which we believe is something real. It's something out there, yes. On the other hand, if I ask you, measure the momentum of an electron, the mass of an electron, or whatever related to an electron, if you want to measure all those things, you will never ever get a complex number you will always get a real number. So in that sense, there is a distinction between real and complex numbers. But on the other hand, if you don't put this I, the behavior of an electron which is in a real object in our universe cannot be predicted precisely. So that's up to you to decide what you want to call it. Okay? So you see that this is what I'm saying, that complex numbers are really essential for now uh, what we have is even in physics, not just in mathematics. So, with this a long introduction, let us now uh, formally start our studies of complex numbers, but the logic here that I am following is the main logic, mathematical logic. I want to keep arithmetic of the set of real numbers intact. I added one new rule to it. I squared is minus one. And I want to explore the new consequences of this assumption. Okay, any questions? Okay, now let us start. Uh, so, a complex number, a number of this form, a plus bi, where a and b are real, okay, numbers, and i squared is minus 1, is called a complex number. That's just a definition from mathematical points of view. Complex numbers are usually denoted by these letters. This is a standard in the context of complex numbers. Or sometimes if you have more of them, you index them by 1 to, I don't know, w3 and something like that. In the complex number z equals to a plus bi, a, these are terminologies, these are just words, a is called the real part of z and is denoted by rez. This is the symbol we use to denote. And b is called the imaginary part of z and it is denoted by imz. And i, there is a name for it, it's called imaginary unit. Why we call it unit, it becomes clear later, okay? But uh, it is imaginary because uh, people thought that this we have to imagine there are no one, such a number in the set of real numbers, and of course they were right. The set of all complex numbers is denoted by this symbol C for complex, and usually we put this, you see, by LaTeX, if you type it in this form, it means that to, uh, to differentiate this C with any other Cs that might appear in your text. 
So the set of complex numbers is all the numbers of this form such that a and b belongs to R. Yes? So we are not independent of the set of real numbers. For constructing a complex number, I need the set of real numbers. Exactly like when you wanted to construct a rational number, you needed the set of integers, the previous uh, set in the hierarchy. Yes? Okay, any questions? And this remark is usually important to realize. Note that real and imaginary parts of a complex number are real numbers. Okay? So sometimes I have seen the students make mistake. If I give you this number and I ask you to give me the real part, they make it right. But if I ask to give me the imaginary part, they say bi, which is wrong by definition. So if I ask you what is the imaginary part, you need to give me just b not bi. This is definition. There is no y for it. Okay, now determine the real and imaginary parts of the following complex numbers. Uh, so, 5i, let us just do it quickly, that's very simple. So, what is the real part and imaginary part of this number? So, real part of 5 plus 3i is 5, the imaginary part of 5 plus 3i is 3, not 3i. Okay? And then if I do the same thing for this one, the real part of square root of 2 minus 3 over 4 times i is a square root of 2. And if I ask you the imaginary part, so what is the imaginary part? The imaginary part is negative 3 quarters. Okay, but what about number 3? So what is the real part? Zero. The real part is 0 and the imaginary part is negative 3. Why? Because 3i minus 3i should be interpreted in this way. 0 plus minus 3 times i, something like that. And then it becomes evident that the real part of minus 3i is nothing except 0, and the imaginary part of minus 3i is negative 3. Yes? These kinds of numbers have a name. If the real part of a complex number is 0, that is called pure imaginary. So let me also write it down for you. So this is called pure imaginary. These are the words that people need them, so they have written them, actually. Okay, so pure imaginary. A pure imaginary number is a complex number whose real part is zero. Now, talk about number four. Do you think that minus eight is also a complex number, yes or no? Yeah, exactly. This is a, this is a, you should be very definite, no, no might be. This is definitely a complex number. So let us go back to this diagram here. You see that the set of complex numbers include, includes everything. There are some parts which is new, okay? These are, for example, i lives here, 3i lives here, 1 plus 2i lives here. But this 1 is already in C automatically. It is in N. It's also in C. So every number is actually a complex number. Okay? So minus 8 is also a complex number. So what I do, if I want to write it, I would say that number 4, first I write minus 8 to be equal to minus 8 plus 0i. Yes. Why, by the way, I can do this? Do you remember I told you that I want to keep all the rules of the game as before? So a number multiplied by zero was zero, so the same is still true. I want myself, I, my, I demand to keep it. So then if I ask you what is the real part of minus eight, you will answer minus eight. But if I ask you what is the imaginary part of minus eight, you say zero. And number five, let me just write it here, unfortunately. I didn't predict quite well. So for number 0, you can write 0 equals to 0 plus 0i. So the real 
of 0 is equal to imaginary of 0 is equal to 0. And this, when in complex numbers I say 0, I mean a complex number whose both imaginary and real parts are simultaneously 0. And then, of course, you realize this remark. Any, any real number A can also be imagined in this form. So, any real number is also a complex number whose real part, whose imaginary part is zero. So this is why in the language of set theory, R is a subset of, of C. Okay, now a, a definition of complex equality of complex numbers. We know what, we, what is meant by equality between two real numbers. So we, I am constructing a new arithmetic with the set C so we need to define more or less everything. We need to define what do we mean uh, by equality of complex numbers, what is meant by adding two complex numbers, multiplying them, I don't know, dividing them, raising them to powers, taking roots of them. We need to set up more or less everything from scratch, but having in mind that we have a new rule of the game. Okay? So, equation, equality of complex numbers. It is defined in a very natural way. So we say two complex numbers are said to be equal, are defined to be equal, if and only if the real parts separately are the same and the imaginary parts are the same. Okay? This is the definition of equality of two complex numbers. So, equality of complex numbers, that's also a powerful point, the point of a strength for complex numbers. When I say two real numbers are equal, that is just one piece of information. Two real numbers are equal. But when I say two complex numbers are equal, this is not just one single piece of information. It gives rise to two, piece, two pieces of information. So, you see, this I have two equalities, so that's also one thing very important. Now let us just solve this very simple example. Determine the real numbers x and y such that this equality holds. Okay, so this equality holds if and only if the real parts are the same and the imaginary parts are the same. So if I ask you what is the real part on the left hand side, you would say 2. What is the real part on the right hand side? The whole x plus y plays the role of the real part. So they have to match. And the imaginary part of the left hand side is x minus y. The imaginary part of the right hand side is minus 3. They also have to match. So this is very simple, yes? So what I can do, I can write x plus y equals to 2 and x minus y equals to minus 3. And then I solve this system in the set of real numbers because according to the problem, it's assumed that x and y are real numbers. Okay? By the way, when I say real numbers, I told you automatically it's the complex numbers. But if you are working in the comp context of complex numbers, when I say real number, I mean a complex number whose imaginary part is zero. So it is always good to have this distinction by these words. Okay, so I will add them together, for example, what happens? 2x becomes negative 1, and then x becomes negative 1 half. So this is x, and then uh, I put it in one of them, and then let me just do it in my head. It becomes 5 over 2, yes? It's very simple. Uh, by the way, let me ask you one question here. I just want to make sure. If I give you this, x minus 2 plus y minus 3 times i equals to 0, can I find x and y? Yes, so what is x and what is y? Uh, x is 2 and y is 3. Yes, exactly. So don't get confused because I told you, if just if you write 0, what we mean by 0? Zero? 0 means 0 plus 0i. Zero so definitely the real parts should match. The imaginary parts should also match. So you can solve it. So be careful about this. Very simple thing. 
The next step after we learn what is the meaning of equality, we need to start arithmetic. Okay, so definition, the sum and difference of complex numbers. And that is also very natural. So if I have two complex numbers, one of them say Z, the other one W, the sum and difference are defined as follows. By, uh, by the way, I want you to see that this is natural. This is the, probably this is the only way to define the sum, the sum and the difference if I want to keep the previous arithmetic the same. Why? Because, for example, let us compare it with this one. Now, let me write something, then I will clean it. So here, if I give you a plus bx, assume that you are working in the set of real numbers. Forget about complex numbers totally. And if I ask you to add these two, let me give numerical examples. Might be it is easier to understand. So if I give you 1 plus 2x, and I, if I ask you to add it to 3 plus 5x, so you immediately answer me. You say that it is 4 plus 7x. Actually, you added the numbers and you added the uh, similar parts. And I told you that I want to keep the same arithmetic for complex numbers. So then this definition is completely is the only way that I can expect. Why? Because instead of x, let me write 1 plus 2i, and I ask you to add 3 plus 5i to it, and I am telling you all the rules, I want to keep them as before. If I tell you this, if I grant you with this, then you do the same thing. You would say that I add 1 to 3, it becomes 4, and I add 2i plus 5i, and I write 7i. So what I'm trying to say is that if you want the previous arithmetic intact, this is the only way to add two complex numbers. And that is exactly what is going on here. So this tells you that if you want to add these two, add the real parts and add the imaginary parts. So when you add bi to di, you can also factor it out. Yes? So this is the... Mm, only way to define the sum and the difference if I want to keep the previous rules the same. So yeah, just as a very simple example. Uh, so if you want to calculate in this example z and w are given to you, you are supposed to calculate this. By the way, these formulas are not given in the formula sheet. They expect you to do everything from scratch every time. So okay, and that's of course easier because you see that uh, the, the other one is a little bit surprising, you will see. The product and the quotient, this is not something that you might guess immediately. Okay, we will come to it. <clears throat> so let me just calculate this very quickly, it's very simple. I want to add z and w together, so it becomes 2 plus 3i plus minus 4 plus 5i. So let us not waste time. 2 minus 4 is minus 2, 3i plus 5i is 8i. And if I want to calculate this, so it becomes 2 plus 3i minus, <clears throat> minus 4 plus 5i. So this becomes <clears throat> 2 plus 3i. I multiply the minus sign in because I want to keep all the rules the same. So it becomes 6 minus 2i. So that's the answer to this problem. <clears throat> and I think this is also evident, yes? The real part of the sum is the real part of the first one plus the real part of the second one. The same true is for imaginary part. And the real part of the difference is the real part of the first one minus the real part of the second one. I think it's very easy, yes? For example, here, if I ask you, what is the real part of z? You say 2. What is the real part of w? It is minus 4. If I add them, it becomes minus 2. And if I ask you what is the real part of the sum, you see it is minus 2. So it is very, very simple. Uh, but I don't know, I don't want to show you the next uh, definition, but let us explore what do you think would be a good definition for the product. What I mean, <clears throat> if... I give you this, 
and I give you this, what is a good way to define Z times W? This is not something very immediately evident. We need to explore it. But if you give me the strategy, I will follow your strategy. Maybe we try to define as a variable. Yes, exactly. Because I told you that I want to keep all the rules the same. So let me write something. I will clean it because I have writ written it properly in the coming uh, theory, uh, definition. My minus one, exactly. So what we say, we say that if, if, if I insist to keep all the rules, if I multiply them, it means that I should be able to use the rules of arithmetic of real numbers. If I want to use those rules, then I am allowed to distribute this here, 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 and there, yes? Okay, and then uh, let me, by the way, write it in this space that I have now. You see that it is a little bit strange. You see, strange things can happen. So this would be definition. And these are not in the formula sheet, so you need to do it over and over again. Especially for division is a little bit strange. Why on earth we need to define the division of these two numbers in this very uh, complicated form, apparently complicated form? But I want you to motivate you. I want to motivate you. This is the only way to do if you want to keep everything so far the same. This is my goal. You see, I have written definition. In mathematics, when you say definition, there is no proof for that. But you can motivate why the definition is a reasonable definition. Okay, so I am just trying to motivate you, especially for division, it seems so complicated. If I want to divide two complex numbers, why I have to follow this strange rule? But I want to motivate you, this is inevitable. You have to follow this, and this is the only way. Let me do it for the product first, which is simpler. Okay, I am telling you, what I am just telling you, these formulas are not in the formula sheet and you are not allowed to use them. You need to know how to calculate them every time. Okay? And by the way, it's not a good idea to memorize them. Okay, so let us see what we can do. Motivation. Four definitions. Okay, so what if I want to motivate you, so let me write Z times W. Instead of Z, I put A plus BI, which is given in the definition. You see Z is this one, W is this one. Multiply it by a C plus DI. I told you that my goal is to keep the rules the same, so I can distribute. I can write A times C plus A times D times I plus B times C times I plus b times d times i squared. Okay, uh, this becomes ac plus, between these two, I have the same rules, so I should be able to factor this out if the rules are the same. I factor an i out, and then you realize i squared is the only new rule in the game, so it becomes minus 1. And then what happens, it becomes a minus BD. And then I just write them properly. You see, it becomes AC minus BD. And then I will have AD plus BC. Yes? And that is exactly, hopefully I haven't mistyped anything, AC minus BD, AD plus BC. You see, it's not very easy to memorize it. Uh, so this is exactly, and you see that I haven't written the proof. Proof is wrong for here. Definitions doesn't have proof. Definitions don't have proofs. Yes, you need to motivate the definition if you want. But this is a little bit technical. Why should I have this definition for division? Okay, let me write it here for you. Let us see how this will go. So I have to write a very smaller this time. So Z over W is equal to A plus BI divided by C plus DI. Do you have any idea how to go on? 
because let me just guide you you see here I appears in the denominator I appears in the numerator but if I ask you what is a complex number you should be able to write it in this form you should write something plus something else times I in this form you can this is the standard form of the complex number so hopefully you agree with me this is still not in that form but this one is exactly in this form if I ask you what is playing the role of the box this is playing the role of the box and if I ask you what's the playing the role of the circle this is playing the role of the circle so the only thing is that when I divide them how can I put it back in this form it's a little bit technical and you need to do it every time as I told you this formula is not in the formula sheet so the, tech, the trick is this you multiply it the numerator you multiply the numerator and the denominator by the com could by the conjugate of the denominator I will talk about the word conjugate later formally but here I mean you multiply by this first of all is it a reasonable equality yes. why yes and I hope that you understand that this is not a circular argument here if I ask you what is another name for this one you see this is a fraction of complex numbers this is also a fraction of complex numbers but for this one I give you immediately an answer what is the answer one why because I told you that I want to keep the rules the same one of the rules was that if I have a number divided by itself it is equal to 1 do you remember that's a famous rule in real numbers and I told you I want to keep all the rules the same so if someone ask, asks me what is this I would say this is 1 because of this keeping this rule the same it's not a circular argument but what is the benefit of doing so because I start and then another rule is that if I have a fraction another fraction I am allowed to multiply the numerators and the denominators because I want to keep the rules the same so let us do that it becomes a plus B a B I let me multiply it if you don't mind so let me multiply it a C minus a D plus B C minus B D uh, no B C I minus b d i squared in the denominator I will do the same thing but there is a shortcut to it the shortcut is using the conjugate pattern yes because I have the same rules so the conjugate pattern becomes the first one to the two minus the second one to the two okay I can simplify the numerator it becomes a c minus a d and then uh, I have I made a mistake somewhere I don't know uh, yes in the numerator there is a I missing here you see if I multi let me make it bigger so that you can see it better so a times C is this one a times minus D I is this one B I times C is this one and then you have my B I times minus D I is this one and this multiplied by that is the conjugate rule the first one to the two minus the second one to the two and you know that this is exactly minus one again so if I do the numerator sim uh, let me simplify the numerator so what is the answer to the numerator the answer would be uh, a AC plus BD do you agree with me and then I can factor an I out then I will have BC minus AD but in the numerator can you tell me what should I write C squared is C squared but what can I write for the rest plus, D. plus D squared yes exactly yes why because D times I to power 2 
I want to keep the rules the same so it becomes d squared i squared but i squared is negative 1 so it becomes minus d squared there is another negative sign here it becomes that one and then because I want to keep the rules the same I am allowed to divide separately I can write ac plus bd divided by c squared plus d squared plus bc minus ad divided by c squared plus d squared times i. I hope that you see it is reasonable and this is the only way. Why I should separate them? Can this play the role of a real part? Yes, remember a, b, c and d themselves are pure real numbers. So if I ask you what type of number is this one, you say this is a real number. What type of number is this one? That's also a real number. So this is exactly in the form of a complex number. A complex number is a number of this form so that this part and this part are real. And these are guaranteed to be real. So this is why even though this formula seems very strange, but this is the only way if we want to keep the old rules the same. Is that understandable? Okay, good. But for the so let me just do one example and then we will be finished here for today. Uh, what is this remark? Oh, and uh, let me get rid of that one. Okay, so let me just solve this example. Uh, here, determine z times w if z and w are here. Determine this one, determine this one. Probably we will have time to solve these two and then you can solve this one yourself. And of course I have written uh, what are the real and imaginary parts of these complex numbers. Okay, let us do it quickly. This is what you need to do every time in the exam, okay? So z times w is equal to 1 plus 2i multiplied by 2 minus i. Just multiply them as if they are polynomials. So 2 minus i plus 4i minus 2i squared. And then what you write is 2 plus 3i plus 2. Why? Because i squared is minus 1. And then what you get is equal to 4 plus 3i. And then if I ask you what is the real part of the product, the real part is 4. What is the imaginary part of the product? It is 3. And it is different from multiplying the real part by real part. If you multiply the real part by real part, you get 2, but the real part is 4. So this is why I have written for you this remark. And the same thing for this one. Okay, now let us do this one z divided by w. What is z? z is 1 plus 2i divided by w is 2 minus i. What I have to do, I have to rewrite it once more and this time multiply the numerator and the denominator by an expression that makes a conjugate pattern with the denominator. So this becomes 1 plus, sorry, uh, 2 plus i. And then I start multiplying them out. So in the numerator, I just simply multiply. So it becomes 2 plus i plus 4i plus 2i squared. But for the denominator, I, I can, of course, multiply, but I prefer to use the conjugate rule. Now everywhere that I see i squared, I put minus 1. So it becomes 2 plus 5i minus 2. The denominator becomes... The denominator becomes 2 plus 1. And then what happens? 2 and 2 are cancelled, so I will get 5i divided by 3. So let us write it as 5 over 3i. Now if I ask you what is the real part of z over w, you would say it is 0. It's pure imaginary. And what is the imaginary part of z over w? you will see that this is 5 over 3. So whenever you want to divide, you need to remember this trick <coughs> of multiplying by the conjugate pattern. Okay, uh, 
I think it's better to stop here. Yes, please. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you should have mentioned it earlier. Okay, so thank you. This is four, yes. <clears throat> so this is four. I made a small mistake then here. The next one is also four. So it becomes five. It, even it is much nicer now. Yes. Yeah, it's five. It becomes I. So again, this the first one is co correct, and then the next one is uh, one. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, okay, I will continue this uh, next uh, time. Uh, you can, of course, uh, solve it yourself, but I will start from example number five the next time. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let me stop this video.